conclusion, I, I, I do nonpartisan very poorly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a place to learn, you see. <laughs> that's why I, I just... I said, I, I, I finally said after trying it out, it's, I wasn't very good at it. So, old school partisan. That way, it's all clear. All right. Well, Priscilla's another person. She's very good. Yeah. She's very good. But, but uh, in terms of like um, not pushing her ideas, or not pushing her position, that's not her deal. Yeah, and she'll usually throw about well, three quarters of the way into there, just almost to the pole, and she'll yeah. just kind of like a boom. Yeah. <laughs> no, she has strong positions. That's why I like her, and she like just defends them, right? Like she's not the person that's gonna be like, oh, this side, that yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, like, boom, yeah, boom, yeah. just hits you, right? Yeah. Which I think it's great. Mm -hmm. But I think academics need both, right? I think some academics who are like the way things, other academics are like, you know, just get to the point, right? This is what you, uh, you know. Some academics and people who have to work out there, you have to kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, academics allows us freedom, I think, to, to be one or the other. Yeah. Right? If you yeah. want to be sort of like, you know, yeah. Yeah. playing both sides a bit, that's fine. Yeah. But if you, I think anyway, it's a legitimate, some people might disagree, a legitimate academic choice just to be like partisan. Right. Hey, Lillian, thanks for coming. Okay. Okay. As long as you hear what I have to say. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk that fair enough. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Okay. That's the reaction I'm looking for. <coughs> mm. All right. Oh, this is a good turnout. Do you usually get too many people or is it too mixed sometimes? Yeah. Challenging exercise to make people is it, know what's on is it every month or is it no? Um, Yes, obviously. This 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 is a topic that does get certain people out yeah. more than yeah. other topics, yeah. right? Some topics we get lawyers from downtown, but it's mm -hmm. increasingly tougher for them to get over here and yeah. because of traffic and parking. So yeah, uh, I never thought of that. But that used to be a lot mm -hmm. of people coming from out of town sometimes on a legal document. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you want to start? Okay, well, good afternoon, and Thanks thank you to, uh, to everyone for being here. Um, my name is Dwight Newman. I'm from the faculty of the College of Law, and I've agreed to moderate today's panel. Uh, and there are a few things just to say at the outset. Uh, in the first instance, uh, uh, I uh, wish to offer the acknowledgement that as we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. Uh, we pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationships with one another. Uh, second, I'd like to thank uh, the McCurcher Law Firm for its uh, ongoing sponsorship of the speaker series at the College of Law. Um, we have uh, members here from the, uh, the speakers committee that work actively in setting up that series and uh, 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 they've uh, uh, hidden in the, the third row for today. But uh, uh, their, uh, their work uh, is ongoing and the McCurcher sponsorship uh, uh, as uh, vital assistance on the financial side, and so we acknowledge that also. Uh, third, I want to uh, briefly mention the definitions that have gone around, uh, and uh, they're rather imposing in some ways. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of different uh, models of electoral reform, and uh, we did wish to make those uh, terms available to everyone here in the audience so that as we discuss things, uh, there's the, the chance to have some clarity on the terms. Uh, the first set of uh, possibilities are plurality or majority systems, as they're described in this document. Uh, the current system, of course, is the first-past-the-post system uh, that's listed first amongst those possibilities. Uh, there would be models of electoral reform that are still within that broad category, such as the alternative vote uh, type system uh, that's mentioned second. 
uh, which allows uh, voters to rank candidates running in their electoral district uh, and then to have their votes transferred uh, uh, with the lowest ranked candidate dropped gradually until uh, a candidate has a majority of the ballots cast in that constituency. There are some other models of uh, these systems as well, two round voting systems and others. There are proportional representation possibilities. Uh, so one of those is uh, the proportional representation list uh, under which uh, the parties draw up lists essentially uh, and uh, then uh, there's a, a ranking and uh, citizens vote for a party, not for a specific candidate, uh, and there are more features listed to that as well. Uh, a single transferable vote uh, where citizens in multi-member electoral districts rank candidates on the ballot, uh, and then there are variations even within that system. Uh, and then there are other mixed systems like a mixed member majority system or a mixed member proportional system that offer various permutations and combinations of some of the other models. Um, so there are a lot of different models that could be under discussion uh, and uh, we've handed around this, uh, this handout just to try to help with some clarity on that uh, but of course the, uh, the speakers will be very precise on what they uh, are referring to as well. Um, there will be uh, some initial comments from each of our three speakers whom I'll introduce in just one moment. Uh, then there will be a, a chance for interaction uh, and I may ask them some questions but we'll certainly also have an opportunity for audience questions. Uh, there are some uh, uh, rules on that. Um, uh, an audience question should be in the form of a question and should probably be fairly succinct um, rather than be a, a long speech. So uh, just I would encourage those uh, pieces of guidance in terms of what an audience question means. Um, and we do appreciate all of you being here and hope you will participate in the discussion. Uh, but we do have three, uh, three eminent experts who are uh, uh, up on the, uh, uh, the front here that uh, will offer the, the main comments. Um, uh, just one further thing to do then is to introduce these three eminent experts and we greatly appreciate their, their presence here at the College of Law. They've all come from outside of the college, although some of them are College of Law recidivists in different ways, um, who've come here regularly for different events and contributed in various ways to discussions within the college and we always appreciate them when they do come. Um, on the furthest end, we have, uh, and I'll introduce him in the order that they're going to speak, uh, John Courtney, uh, who is currently a senior policy fellow at the Johnson Shuyama Graduate School of Public Policy and Professor Emeritus uh, from the Department of Political Studies in the College of Arts and Science. Uh, he has a, a, an enormous list of uh, publications over, uh, over his career. Uh, and uh, just to mention some of the, the later ones, the Oxford Handbook of Canadian Politics. Uh, he was the co-editor of that, published in 2010. He's written on election issues, a book with the UBC Press in 2004. Um, he's written on uh, riding design and uh, the design of Canada's electoral districts and um, later served in that capacity on um, electoral uh, boundaries commissions and so on. And uh, really an innumerable list of uh, publications over the decades, um, many interviews, um, and uh, just a, a tremendous contribution in Canadian political science. Uh, he'd, uh, I believe, stayed at Duke University in the past, and, uh, uh, but has been in the, uh, uh, the college, uh, or in the Department of Political Studies here for many years, and uh, uh, as I say, has contributed in the College of Law in the past as well. Uh, Dave McGrain, uh, seated uh, the closest to me at the moment, um, is a faculty member currently in political studies and in St. Thomas More College. Uh, he originates from Saskatchewan and did his uh, undergraduate degree in political science at the University of Regina, his master's degree in political science at York University in Toronto. He did his PhD at Carleton University in Ottawa and as I say is now a faculty member at STM and at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he's published in many academic journals. Uh, he's published uh, a number of uh, books as well, uh, including uh, Remaining Loyal, Social Democracy in Quebec and Saskatchewan with McGill Queen's University Press. Uh, he has a book project underway, uh, currently uh, an edited collection stemming from 
uh, conference that he organized in this very room before on uh, Alan Blakeney and his legacy on democracy. He's been a frequent media commentator, uh, served the community in many different capacities on different organizations, and as of this weekend, has been elected party president of the Saskatchewan NDP party, uh, and so is uh, contributing in a, a different way there, and now uh, has said he'll specifically make partisan remarks uh, sure. rather than <laughs> nonpartisan remarks. Uh, Dr. Benita Beattie um, from the Department of Indigenous Studies uh, is uh, uh, the, the panelist in the middle. Um, she uh, serves in a number of different roles here at the university, at the International Center for Northern Governance and Development, as well as in the Department of Indigenous Studies. Um, she's uh, originally from uh, Deschambault Lake in Saskatchewan and a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. Um, she's done uh, a lot of uh, work outside the academic context in the area of First Nations health management, administration, policy making, strategic planning, community development. Uh, she was a senior policy analyst for the provincial government in the Saskatchewan Indian and Métis Affairs Secretariat uh, and has served in uh, um, uh, leadership roles within the governance structure of the, the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation Health Services uh, and, uh, and the FSIN. Um, she's received the Provost Outstanding Graduate Teaching Award in recognition of her leadership in developing the Master of Northern Governance and Development Program as well as her ongoing commitment to the success of Northern students. And she's been involved in a lot of important work uh, on uh, uh, electoral issues in uh, Northern contexts and amongst uh, Indigenous communities and uh, uh, adds an important dimension to the discussions today uh, from uh, that work as well. So uh, with those overly long introductions perhaps, but still too short for what these three people have done uh, in all three cases, um, I uh, do want to hand the floor over to each of them for a few minutes to offer some opening remarks and then we'll turn to um, some chance for audience questions. There will be some people leaving around the one o'clock mark for some classes uh, and we'll wrap up the whole session around 1.20, 1.25 because there are more classes that, go, that get going after that as well. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Courtney, uh, I'll invite you up and we'll get your PowerPoint up on the screen as well. Thank you, Dwight, for that very kind invitation, and thanks to Wanda Wiegers and her committee for having invited me to take part. Is this on? The audience is saying they can't hear you. Oh, okay. So sorry. It's on, but you can't hear me. How's okay. that, everyone? Okay. Is that all right at the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I uh, would like to thank Wanda and her committee for having invited me, and Dwight for having served today as a moderator. It's a pleasure to be back in the law school a year ago, right now, in this very room. As Dwight pointed out, we were having a conference in honor of Alan Blakeney, and it was truly a great conference. It was a wonderful chance for academics and practitioners to get together for a weekend in honor of a, an outstanding Canadian. Now, I, what I've done today is put together a little PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to run through very quickly and by, by all means uh, at the end of the exercise when the three speakers have completed, then by all means do raise a question about any of the points that I'm making. I first want to talk about uh, four, I, I want to make clear that there are four known established facts in political science about electoral systems. The first is that there are no perfect electoral system. Each has its own strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, this is not by any means a new debate in Canada. 
The third is once established, an electoral system generates its own defenders and its own critics. And fourthly, changing a system should be made only when there are compelling reasons to do so. So let's look at each of those four points. First of all, no perfect system. And I admit at the outset there are some systems better tailored to some political uh, institutions than others, but none, no system is absolutely faultless or flawless. Canada's first past the post system, for example, and you've got this on the little handout that you were given, first past the post, and by the way, there is no post that you have to get by. It's just <laughs> whoever wins more votes wins the whole seat. It's strictly a plurality vote, majoritarian if you like, but uh, generally pl plurality vote. Canada's first past the post system has a proven tendency over the years to inflate the winning share of a party's vote that wins big time and to deflate the shares of the losing parties. Now there are exceptions to that and we can certainly dis discuss some of those exceptions but as a rule if you take the most recent federal election the uh, <coughs> Liberals won something in the order of 57 percent of the seats of the House of Commons with just shy of 40 percent of the popular vote. So that's what we call arithmetic inflation for the winning party. But by the same token, the losing parties, most notably in 2015, the NDP, have their share of seats in relation to their share of votes deflated. So the NDP came in at about 19, 19 and half percent, but they won only 44 seats in the parliament. Uh, in addition to that, those facts of, of uh, first past the post, there's also questions that emerge about representational uh, concerns, principally regional and demographic, on the grounds that they play an also an important part in considering election options. And there's no doubt about it, we, we know this as a fact, that right now as we discuss electoral reform questions of how do we get more women in the House of Commons, how do we ensure greater numbers of minority, visible minorities of aboriginals in the House of Commons, these are perfectly legitimate questions and they are certainly on the table. The second point is that this is not a new debate in Canada. Some of the work that I and my colleagues have done over the years looking at the history of this debate is absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, I have read many, many debates in the 1890s, so that's what, 125 years ago, looking at the possibility of replacing Canada's first past the post system. And indeed, all through the 1920s, there were hearty debates with Mackenzie King as Prime Minister actually voting to replace first past the post in a vote in the House of Commons to replace it with either alternative voting or single transferable vote. And this has carried on over the years. We've had various commissions look at, it, look at the question, but nothing has ever changed. At various points, however, three provinces, Manitoba, Alberta, and British Columbia, all adopted either alternative voting and or alternative voting and STV. But subsequently, each of these three provinces reverted back to first past the post. And this is an interesting point to bear in mind when you consider why we change electoral systems. Because the advance billing in Manitoba, Alberta, and British Columbia didn't live up to the realized expectations once the changes had been made. The party system broke down and indeed in Manitoba for 40 years there really was no competitive party system. It was a one-party government. Voter turnout declined markedly and as a result the debate was waged again in the 1950s to replace something that had been adopted in the heyday of progressivism in the 1920s and that's exactly what happened in Alberta as well. In fact some people lay it at the foot of that change uh, the foot of the change away from first past the post, why Alberta has a dominant one-party system. 
as we all know uh, from our history, Canadian history. Third, partisan interests are always going to be at play in these games. So we have to be prepared for that, and we've seen signs of it already at the level of the parliamentary committee. Most notably, the conservatives say they favor no change. They want to retain the first past the post, and they want to put any proposed change, if there should come out of the parliamentary committee, to a national referendum. So that's their position. The NDP and the Greens have uh, advocated some form of proportional representation. It's not always clear in the debates which one they favor. Sometimes it's a more mixed member proportional system. Sometimes it's something like, as we s often hear, pure PR or close to pure PR. The Liberals, for the most part, have not played their hand, although it is generally thought that they would favor some form of alternative voting. Because with alternative voting, you get to indicate your ranked order of choices. And liberals tend to be on balance, particularly in more recent elections. Uh, most NDPers second choice, most conservatives in, uh, second choice. So that on the transfer of the votes within an alternative vote system, the liberals would presumably uh, do well. And of course, this always has to do with the party's own perception of who's winning, who's losing. Uh, am, am I benefiting from the system, or am I somehow being discriminated against by the system? So that all plays into very partisan interests that come into play. Four, and I think this is a really important question for us to consider. Are there compelling reasons to change? For example, is there an overwhelming loss of confidence in government, an overwhelming loss of trust in politicians in Canada? That happened in New Zealand in the early 1990s, and it took its toll on New Zealand politics, on New Zealand parties, and on the New Zealand electorate. There was a loss of confidence in the government that was quite extraordinary, and as a result, the debate was launched with two national referenda, two elections being fought on it, on replacing first past the post with an alternative system. And that is, in fact, what New Zealand did. They opted for a different electoral system. Or is there a collapse of the party system, continual crises in successive governments, external pressures to ensure political and economic stability, and the classic example of that, of course, is Italy from, really, from 1945 on to now. Italy has had 63 governments, I just counted them this morning, 63 governments since 1947. And some of them have lasted a week, some a couple of years. So you, you take your pick, and as a result, they got out of proportional representation, which was undermining and worsening the situation and opted for a form of mixed member proportional, which they now have, and they've tightened it up again in 2015. If none of those conditions pertains to Canada's certain uh, current situation, that is loss of confidence, loss of trust, instability, economic instability, and so on, then why is it we're having this debate? And I simply close with a matter of speculation. When Mr. Trudeau announced, this is Justin Trudeau, on June the 23rd, 2015, that, that, that the 2015 election would be the last election fought on the first-past-the-post system. Question is why? The Liberals were at third place in the poll. They were at 23 percent. The NDP was at 34 percent, Conservatives somewhere between the two. It looked as if, at that point of the campaign, with only six weeks to go, it looked as if the NDP would form a minority government. So how do you make this appeal attractive to the NDP of forming either a coalition or in some way getting the support of uh, the uh, Liberal Party? One possibility is, of course, that they decided to 
opt for an electro electoral reform, which they knew the NDP w wanted. Finally, if NDP were replaced by a different electoral system, would a coalition government result? It's not necessarily the case. Canada has had 43 different elections since 1867. Only 11 of them have led to minority governments. None, except for the wartime coalition of 1917 to 1921, none has ever led to a coalition government. It's not part of our political culture, so we have to bear that in mind. I'm not saying it won't happen, but it's not part of our political history. Would strategic voting come to an end? Some of the advocates of proportional representation say, we want to get rid of first past the post because it is based on strategic choices and we want to get rid of that. I can assure you no electoral system is free of strategic choices for parties, voters, and for the, uh, the governing uh, the coalitions that may or may not result. Would voter turnout increase? There's evidence to suggest about 7% increase on balance up to the 1990s. Now it seems when you've got a reformed electoral system, it's not, no guarantee. In New Zealand, for example, it's fallen by almost 20 percentage, 20 percentage points. <coughs> Finally, would more women and visible minorities be elected? Hard to say. Some countries with proportional representation, arguably Israel, the purest form of PR in the world, uh, stands uh, no, no better than we do in the international ranking of where uh, women stand. Visible minorities, we're already up to 46 uh, in the House, and it could very well be that this is not a feature of uh, a proportional system that is necessarily a slam dunk. You always have to bear in mind the political culture and the political system within which these electoral systems are operating. Thanks, John. Is this mic? Oh, I think it's on. I think I'll just use this one. It's okay. Okay, so uh, thank you very much today uh, to be, um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, always great to be at the College of Law. Uh, I've always had uh, a good relationship with the College of Law and, and, and the uh, professors here. Uh, so as, as Dwight mentioned, um, I tried for many years to be a nonpartisan, <laughs> and I found I did it very poorly. So <laughs> I have decided that today I won't be a nonpartisan. Uh, I will lay out exactly what I think, precisely what I think, and it's going to sound uh, partisan. So uh, if you'll indulge me. Uh, I guess I just, just to start off really slowly here with a, a story, I guess, of myself and maybe my, my, my partisan past. I remember, in, I remember my first, actually, I remember my very first election. My first federal election was in 1997. I was, uh, I just turned 18. Uh, I had a bit longer hair. I was flowing long hair. Yeah, I it was actually dyed blonde even. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a good looking 18 uh, year old. And I was, and I, you know, and I, and I joined the NDP and I was so excited about joining the NDP and I knocked on doors for Dick Proctor who was the NDP candidate. And then, the, then you know, election day came. I went into that, into that, to that voting booth, and I voted for my candidate that I'd worked so hard on. It was an exciting experience. It was a great experience. And election night came, and I drank the champagne of victory. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a great experience. And then the next federal election campaign that I, uh, I, uh, I was involved with, or not really involved with, actually, I, I went to vote in, uh, was in Chicoutimi, Quebec, uh, in 2000. And again, a, a young NDPer, I was living there at the time, uh, you know, the NDP had a, what they called a poteau, really no uh, candidate necessarily, right? Uh, uh, just wasn't very much of a factor, obviously, in that, in that election. It was, a, I think, the riding kind of switched between the Bloc Québécois and the Liberals. And I, dr I drugged myself to the polls, right? I was like, oh, jeez. I mean, I'll go, right? I'll go. But, I mean, it really doesn't matter what happens here, right? I mean, I'll throw in for this guy, uh, you know, this NDP guy, but, I mean, it's not going to really matter. So... You know, I, I think when we talk about electoral reform sometimes, we have to talk about it as much as we can from the perspective of the voter, right? What does the voter feel what does the, when they actually go and participate, right? And I guess uh, this comes down to some uh, uh, problems that I find with the first-past-the-post system. And John talked about compelling reasons to change. I guess I'd submit to you today that I have about three compelling reasons why we should change away from the first-past-the-post system. Um, 
and I'll go through them rather quickly. Uh, number one, I think the first past the post system creates false majority after false majority. Uh, the pattern, I think, over the past 30 years in Canada has been pretty clear. Uh, you get one uh, party that gets somewhere, if they, if they can just get close to that 39-40% mark, they pretty much can get a majority government, right? So you've had a, a pattern, I think, in Canada for about the last 30 years or so that somewhere around 60% of the people do not vote for the government that they get, right? And to me, that really, I think, violates a democratic principle of majority rules. And in fact, since 1921, only three times has the federal government been elected with over 50% of the vote. So I think this idea of, of false majority after false majority, and we have a system that, that creates false majority after false majority, I think is something very negative for our politics. Uh, the second reason is the twin problems of wasted vote and strategic voting. So, uh, for instance, I remember I, I, uh, I at the end of one of my classes during the federal election in 2015, this young woman came up to the front, right? Uh, she, uh, she was taking the class, uh, but she wasn't in political studies. And she kind of took me aside and she said, oh, I'm from Mormon, I'm from Mormon. I said, okay, yeah, good, good. And she's like, oh, um, but, you know, um, I don't really think anybody conservative really has a chance there, right? Professor, what do you think? So, I could have lied. I said, oh, no, no, I mean, if things go right, uh, Justin goes down, uh, Mulcair goes up, I mean, maybe that, that ride is going to go the other way. And I, know, I knew that she wanted me to say that to her, right? I knew that she wanted me to say that to her. So I was put in this really strange situation where I was like, I, I was like, well, it, it, I mean, I, I did this, right? <laughs> and uh, I finally said, well, it's a tough riding for any other party, right? It's a tough riding for any other party. I mean, the conservatives are very solid there. You never know what's going to happen. And she kind of said, oh, okay, that's kind of what I thought. I don't think I'm going to vote. And she kind of, kind of walked away. Um, wasted votes, right? A wasted vote. The, the, and, this, and this woman, you know, in, in, in our system, right, you know, f felt compelled to think like that. And this young woman ended up voting. Uh, the other thing with that, obviously, is that, so if it's not a wasted vote, then it's a strategic vote. Right? Strategic vote. I can't tell you how many times in the last campaign these people would stop me on the street. I was on the television once in a while. I was known as political science. And they'd come up. They'd almost have tears in their eyes. And they'd say, listen, who has the better chance of beating Stephen Harper in Saskatoon University? I got to know. I got to know. And you know, they never asked me about policy, by the way. I could have told them that. I could have. I could have said, oh, yeah, I can tell you that. But no, they were like, th their eyes. I remember their eyes. I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I didn't know. How could I know that? Right? So strategic voting as well, I think, is a big problem. And I did some polling after the last federal election, and I actually found that just under a quarter of Canadians, about 25% 25, 25 of Canadians re reported in the polling I did that they did not vote for their preferred party. So by a quick math, if my polling is correct, and I could be off a little bit, I would say there was around 4 million Canadians in the last federal election that did not vote for their preferred party. They voted for a, another party. Uh, I think also first past the post uh, creates uh, disincentives to cross-party cooperation. Uh, I think you have a lot of incentives built in to be very adversarial because all you have to do is get that 39, 38 percent. You know, so if, so if you're the opposition and you're in a minority government, right? You kind of think you're going to get there. The majority government or the minority government thinks it's going to get there too. So in, even in a minority parliament, it doesn't work all that well in terms of creating uh, incentives to. Uh, cooperate, and of course, in a majority government parliament, co cooperation. What's that, right? I mean, what's, Why would you even bother to uh, talk to your to your opposition parties, right? You, you, like, why even bother? You got your absolute majority. Uh, Justin Trudeau has absolute majority right now. Uh, that's fairly guaranteed. It's, it's fairly comfortable. No even reason. So I think Canadians want their politicians to cooperate, but yet once again, we have a system that forces Canadians to strategically vote. We have a system that I think forces, Canadian, forces politicians to not cooperate with each other. There is disincentives built in the system to cooperate with each other. So just to end off then, what's my preferred system? Well, I agree with John that there's no perfect uh, system. Uh, but I do think the mixed member proportional system, the MMP system, is a better system. So why would I think that? I mean, uh, you know, look in 1997 with the Scots, right? The Scot Scottish uh, devolution in 1997. Now, they had experience for many years with first past the post. They decided to actually go with MMP. So why is MMP, I think, a good system? Just a really quick, quick little bit here. Uh, as you know, you'll get two 
two votes in the MMP system, so two for one, kind of like the two for one pizza, I don't know if there's two more pizza up there, right? But who doesn't want a two for one? But you get a two for one, right? You get a two for one. You get two, uh, two different uh, votes, and you get one for the party and one for the local candidate. And I think that's going to create some great things for Canadian democracy, which I'll end off with. Uh, I think it will uh, eliminate these false majorities. I think you're going to have an MMP system. You have more. You're going to inject some more proportional representation, proportionality, sorry, into it. Um, though John, and I might slightly disagree on this. I do think an MMP system would probably make uh, minority governments quite a permanent feature, and probably even coalition governments. So I think under an MMP system, you're definitely going to have more cross-party cooperation. Um, I really think that MMP system is going to drive a stake through the heart of strategic voting and wasted votes. I think no longer will you, uh, in terms of wasted vote, you know, at the very least you know that you're going to be able to vote for the party you like. Even if you're a uh, green voter in Oxbow, Saskatchewan, you can still vote for the party that you like. Now, with your candidate, who knows, that might be tougher. But nonetheless, you at least get one vote. You get to the voice stage, so you just be excited. So as a young man in Quebec, I've at least been excited to have contributed to my party that, 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 that I had been, became so enamored with in the previous election. Um, I think also in terms of the horse race polls, I think in the first practical system, because it's, there's all the strategic going on, going on, the horse race polls become very important, right? Who has momentum? Is Trudeau up? Is he down? Et cetera, et cetera. I think this will be a bit less of the situation, right? Because I think people will still have this sort of vote that's not, doesn't have to be strategic. You know, you just have the one vote that's to come in some ways completely non-strategic. Like I said, you can be a green in Oxford and still have that vote. So I think that sort of part of the politics will be decreased a little bit. Uh, and will be more, have a more issue-based politics. Um, I do think other NMP, that local representation, which is important, is maintained. Everybody still has their local representative uh, from their riding. Uh, the ridings might be a bit bigger, but you still have your local representative. And even in terms of, of the way the Scots have done it, I think it's interesting. So, you have, so not only do you have your local representative, representative, but you have your local sort of your representative from the list that is actually from a region of Scotland. So being the, the equivalent of, of in Saskatchewan, you think, I'm from Saskatchewan University, I have my, uh, my local representative from Saskatchewan University riding, but also have a representative from all of Saskatchewan as a whole, because you'd split up the MMP generally by province. So you would also have an extra sort of local MP. Now I know maybe that local MP is not in Saskatoon, but it's still in Saskatchewan, right? So I think MMP does provide uh, sort of some local representation. Uh, it creates uh, lots of different uh, possibilities around diversification of the legislature, more diverse legislature, interesting things around what they call zipper lists. So a zipper list is simply one man, one woman, one man, one woman, one man, one woman. You can also do interesting things when you have lists in terms of increasing diversity. And so I do think that, well, it's not a guarantee you're going to increase diversity. I agree with John on this. You definitely have more possibilities with increasing diversity in the legislature with a MMP system. Um, and I guess just to end off here, I hope I'm, I still have time just to, just to finish off. Um, you know, I, I, think that, uh, I think that John set some pretty high bars for change there, right? If I remember correctly, it was uh, economic instability and uh, lack of trust, lack of confidence. I, I guess I would s submit to, to disagree with John here uh, that I don't think we have to have that high of a bar for change of our electoral system. I would submit that we should change our electoral system because there's a better one out there, right? There's a better one out there. I don't think we have to have some sort of existential crisis in order to change the electoral system. I think there's a better one out there. Uh, and and, and, and it's, you know, in some ways, it's, it's, it's it are, we have a very outdated electoral system. And I like it in a way to, you know, like seatbelts. Right? Remember when, remember when seatbelts came in? Right? You know, everybody was like, seatbelts, I don't need a seatbelt. Right? What does a seatbelt do for me? Right? And you had to try to convince people to wear seatbelts. But we made a change in our society, right? We made a change in our society because we, we figured out that there was a better system out there, that these belts al across our laps would save our lives. I think that, at the end of the day, it's a bit like that, right? I think there's a better system out there. There's a better system out there, and, uh, and, and we can go and get it and change it, and we can make that change. And I think by doing so, we're going to make our politics more exciting for citizens, right? We're going to make our politics more exciting for people, uh, and I think people become more engaged, and I think that we're going to have a much more dynamic democracy because of it. So that's my partisan uh, a plea and my partisan rant, if you will. And so I uh, thank you for indulging me. I look forward to the uh, discussion.
I'll figure it out. Um, and now you've heard the one side and the other side, and I'm in the middle side. So I guess this is uh, c uh, my comments are going to have to do with uh, indigenous um, perspectives, and perhaps not so much um, indigenous, but certainly my perspective on um, what electoral reform, or whether there should be an electoral reform, or if so, what, what should it look like, and so on. So. You know, in the, in, uh, we inherited um, the British colonial system in terms of the parliamentary system, and we ran through some, you know, skirmishes with different things with Indigenous peoples in Canada. But one thing for sure, um, I'm really glad, is that I'm not in the United States right now, <laughs> and uh, I'm quite happy where we are. So, uh, um, but this whole story of Indigenous peoples within any uh, British inherited system because it is a colonial system. It's beyond our time, um, but it certainly was a fledgling democracy, and it created systems and rules around elections and who could vote and register and so on, that excluded a lot of people. And so it certainly excluded Indigenous people, excluded gender, for many many years, and uh, so I guess the whole Indigenous relationship with electoral systems has to do with. Uh, the story of engaging. It's the story of engagement uh, to whatever degree it is with, uh, with the Canadian political system. And uh, there, there's a, um, a spectrum of views on that that I've heard over the years and certainly if you're looking at the um, voting turnouts and so on that we've looked at and um, on the one hand you'll have people who will uh, corroborate and will say Yes, get the indigenous people right into the election system, getting in, get them into representatives in, in parliament, in the legislatures of our provinces, get them into the system period, get them involved in, in, the, in the processes leading up to getting, um, um, uh, getting, in, getting elected, and so on. And, and on the other hand, you have other people in the indigenous community that will say, mm, no, we're not, we're wasting our time, they're not going to, no matter which party gets in, they're not going to listen to us. We're, we're, they're just going to tell us things that are, that are not going to be right anyhow. So we prefer our treaty perspective. We prefer to go our treaty route. We'll, we'll deal with whatever government comes in at the federal level. And uh, no, we're not going to get too involved in it. And for many years, I think that was the view uh, that might have... Um, spoke to some of the low voter, voter turnout, particularly after, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and it's really improved since. And uh, if, you, if you take a look at the way um, even the representation now within, within uh, Parliament, um, there's a lot more Indigenous faces there, and, and people that are familiar with, with treaties and so on. So that is slowly changing. So you have a group of people sort of in the middle of that spectrum. And uh, where I place myself is sort of in the middle of that spectrum. As uh, we had done a study, um, particularly in the north, since I'm from the north, um, you know, um, my background, of course, is in, um, I got a PhD in political science from, from the University of Alberta, and I remember debating at length in one of our forums that we needed to have a different political system. And that was um, um, different than you know, this horse race that we don't even know the rules of how to get into that horse race. And, um, and besides, these were horses. We had dog teams. So what, you know, it's a little bit different there. So it was, uh, it was just, it was fun. It was fun debating, you know, as students do. But, you know, as, as, as time goes on, though, um, the reality is in, in, in the uh, studies that we have done, and, and certainly in the study that we did in the north um, on political engagement, in northern Saskatchewan, we had done with, uh, I had done with um, Dr. Brudal and, and uh, Peltzer. And it was, a, it was a, a good study, and it came across um, looking at the level of engagement Aboriginal people had. And we had uh, over 505 Aboriginal households that we, we had polled, uh, the heads of the households. And to look at their level of, of engagement locally in their bands, in their municipal governments, if that's where they were, or in the, prov in the provincial uh, elections, or in the federal elections. And, and guess what? It's, it's not, it's, uh, the thing is, whoever influences you the most is where you're gonna get most excited about, right? 
So if it's a banned election, that's where you're, the, the voter turnout is going to be the highest. And that's generally what happened in, in, the, in the respondents that we had. The reported, the reported voting turnouts were highest in the banned elections, about 77%, compared to 45% in the provincial voting and 34% in the federal voting. And, um, and by and large, the, uh, the youth, um, with no um, big surprise, were least, least likely to vote in provincial and federal elections. So that, um, and, 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 and uh, it was raised before that political culture is something that, that is usually not looked at very well. Um, certainly it kind of, in terms of political science literature, it kind of fell out of the streams in the 70s and so on, but I think it should be picked up again. Because there, there is a culture that has changed how people's attitudes towards their political system and whether they're, they're, they, you know, they're not going to trust them, they're going to say it's a waste of time, and, and so on and so forth. So in order to change the, the electoral reform, if anything, I think you have to be wary and, and at least knowledgeable about the political culture that is there. As far as indigenous peoples are concerned, no matter what the system, they're still going to be um, wanting some some way of being, having better representation in there, in the, in the far north, in the Nunavut area, and certainly in the provincial north, where the, um, the, the, um, the demographics weren't, the population is bigger, you will likely have an, aber an indigenous candidate there, but certainly not in the, in the, in the um, thank you, in the, in the urban areas, which is where uh, the bulk of the Aboriginal population is starting to go into. The population demographics talk about that, especially in Saskatchewan. And uh, so besides having the franchise history, which in the 60s, Aboriginal First Nations in particular were not allowed to vote until the 1960s, treaty history, their wariness against getting involved with the provincial elections, a lot of the social and economic barriers that have to do with going to the place of voting, even knowing the rules, even knowing who to vote for, it's oftentimes when the voting is so close between the federal and provincial governments for elections, they get mixed up. Is it the federal party I'm voting? Is, it, is this a federal election? Is this a provincial election? So they get people mixed up. And uh, when you don't know somebody, it's a lot harder for you to feel, have warm feelings to vote for them. There has to be a reason for that. And uh, there's also some political ramifications that, that, that come with people engaging in, in elections, even putting your name in to stand, because these are small communities. And uh, everybody knows whether you're, you're this party or that party, or, this, or you're, you know, are you engaging in government, or are you not engaging in government, because you know, there's, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's some ramifications there. So and to, to kind of um, um, close up the, uh, the, um, this debate, uh, there was um, the late Senator Len Marchand, who was one of the first, um, I think, um, First Nations uh, uh, MPs talked about the Electoral Boundaries Act, and he thought that the best way to restructure uh, structural problems was to guarantee Aboriginal people's writings um, that overlaid upon federal electoral districts. So very much a kind of an MMP kind of an idea. Am I there yet to, to, to think that that's the way? I'm leaning towards that, but I'm not sure what that means because there are so many formulas as well in there, and I think that's generally the feeling of most um, people, at least uh, within the indigenous community. We, when you don't know what that really means, what the outcome is going to be, how that's going to influence, is going to improve us or not improve us, is going to get us better, better representation, is going to you know, let us have a better voice, then maybe it's a good thing. You know? and, and I think if you come out with that kind of a reasonable, um, um, do a little bit more study around it, then I think you'd you'd be able to, um, to, to have the more positive changes that we need. But I do think that we do need some change.